What is the significance of Israeli and Western human rights organizations recognizing Israel as an apartheid state? As, are such reports destined for library shelves, or can they have a meaningful impact in the corridors of power, particularly given current developments? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Moin Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Norman Finkelstein, the world-renowned forensic scholar who specializes in exposing politically motivated academic fraud. Finkelstein first came to public attention while still a doctoral student at Princeton University. He meticulously exposed the systematic trickery deployed by a 1980s bestseller purporting to demonstrate that the Palestinians are an invented people. The liberal intelligentsia, which had showered the book with praise, never forgave him. Finkelstein has since published 10 books that have been translated into numerous languages. His best-selling The Holocaust Industry was lauded by the Dean of Holocaust Historians, the late Raoul Hilberg, but in the New York Times was, in Finkelstein's words, reviewed more critically than Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. In Beyond Hutzpah, published by the University of California Press, Finkelstein exposed the methods used by Alan Dershowitz to deflect scrutiny of Israeli war crimes. His efforts ultimately resulted in DePaul University denying Finkelstein tenure in 2007, a landmark in the suppression of academic freedom in the United States. His most recent book is entitled Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. Professor Finkelstein, it's a real pleasure to have you on the program. Well, thank you for having me, except for the fact that you're an old friend, so we'll forget, forego the professor. I've known you now As you wish. for 40 right. years. <laughs> Something like that. So, uh, Norm, I'd like to start our discussion by asking you, about the substance, significance, and implications of the recent Human Rights Watch report, a threshold crossed Israeli authorities and the crimes of apartheid and persecution, as it's entitled. As you know, it comes more than 45 years after the United Nations General Assembly condemned Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination. Against this background, do you nevertheless consider this to be a significant report and if so, why? Well, I think it's a very significant report. Actually, I would say it's a shocking report. It's a bewildering report. It's an amazing report. And I don't usually use those words. I tend to be pretty sober when I evaluate this sort of stuff. But it's a landmark. Let me try to situate it in the short term and then look at it in the long term. In the short term, uh, since about 2009, Palestinians in various permutations and combinations have been trying to get Israel to be held accountable for its war crimes and crimes against humanity in the International Criminal Court. And since that time, since, as I said, roughly 2009, there have been two referrals to the International Criminal Court. The first referral, which pertained to the Mavi Marmara, it, after a very long protracted proceedings, it was basically quashed by the chief prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda. In my opinion, it was a grotesque whitewash of Israeli actions uh, when the flotilla, the humanitarian flotilla, approached Gaza in May. 2010. And then there was a second proceeding which began. Uh, this one uh, advanced by the state of Palestine. Without going through the technicalities, that case uh, was very slow. The chief prosecutor, Fatou Ben Suda, dragged her feet on it, but in a surprising development or reasons which there's no time to go into, a few months ago, more than a few months now, let's say a half year ago, 
uh, the ICC chief prosecutor said she would proceed to an investigation of Israeli war crimes in Gaza and in the West Bank. I myself, as you know personally, Muin, I was skeptical that the case would go very far because all of these technical legal points where it was my opinion Israel actually had a strong case on the technical legal points. And I thought the case would eventually be killed, quashed. But then lo and behold, a very surprising development occurred. And that was Beth Selim, which is Israel's main and most respected human rights organization regarding Israeli conduct in the occupied Palestinian territories. Beth Selim, under the new leadership of Haggai El Ad, it issued a position paper. And the position paper is its essence is basically summarized in the title of the position paper. So if you allow me, I'll just quote the title. A Please. regime a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Colon. This is apartheid. That's the title. Now, there are three notable features of that title. Number one, it doesn't confine its concerns to the occupied Palestinian territories. It now focuses on the whole area from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, including the state of Israel. So it's effectively dropped the pretense that there is an Israel here and occupied territories there. They have now put forth the opinion that there is one seamless territory from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. Number two, they used a very incendiary phrase. They used the phrase, a regime of Jewish supremacy. Now, especially to say an American ear, where in the last few years, because uh, significantly because of the Black Lives Matter movement, there has been a real sensitivity to the notion of white supremacy which is largely associated with the alt-right in the United States and with Donald Trump. And now they use a phrase, Jewish supremacy. And they say, if you read the report or the position paper, that the whole state is built on the principle of Jewish supremacy. So they say that the entire area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River is organized under a single principle, advancing and cementing the supremacy of one group, Jews, over another, Palestinians. And then they take what you might call the natural third step, which is if it's a regime of Jewish supremacy, which advances the interests of one group as against another group, well, says Betselem, that's apartheid. This is an apartheid state. And so Betselem effectively said that from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, Israel proper and the occupied territories, they form one state and it's an apartheid state. That was- Earlier, earlier Yeshdin had taken the position that there is still a distinction between Israel and the occupied territories. So perhaps moving to the 
Human Rights Watch report. Is that closer to the um, B'Tselem or Yesudin position? The Human Rights Watch report, I would say, takes a ambiguous position, though not in word is it ambiguous, but in substance, if you read the report closely. So after the human, after the that Selim report, the second shoe drops, or if you include the ICC investigation, you can say the third shoe drops, and that is the Human Rights Watch report entitled A Threshold Crossed. The Human Rights Watch report does something which Beth Selim does not do. Let me first begin what they do that resembles Beth Selim. They say that Israel has created a regime extending from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, again, the full swathe of land. They say a regime based on Jewish domination, which is I'm sure you who are sensitive to the English language will understand is just a fleece hop from saying Jewish supremacy. In fact, you can almost say they're synonymous. Uh, they say Israel has created a regime of Jewish domination. However, they say that and Israel practices apartheid, practices apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territories. That is, it engages in practices which meet the threshold of, of the crime of apartheid under international law in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and in Gaza. In those three areas, Israel is guilty of, and let me quote them as closely as I can, Israel is guilty of the crime of apartheid, the crime of persecution, and these two crimes are both under international law, they're both crimes against humanity, which Human Rights Watch says, quoting some documents, it says, quoting some conventions, I should say, quoting some conventions, it says that crimes against humanity are among the most odious crimes under international law. So Human Rights Watch says, Israel is guilty, culpable of crimes against humanity in the occupied Palestinian territories. It then tries to make a distinction and it claims that the crimes are less severe in the state of Israel and constitute under international law what it terms abuses, but not yet crimes against humanity. However, even as it qualifies the magnitude of the crimes committed in Israel proper, it does do something which is wholly unprecedented. And that returns to the point that you made about 45 years ago, the, the famous or infamous, famous or notorious, Zionism is a racism resolution in the UN General Assembly. I'll make the connection in a half moment. Let me just convey what Human Rights Watch does, which is unprecedented. That Selim basically limits itself to the current picture. How does it look? And it says it looks like apartheid. This is apartheid. It does not trace back the origin 
of how Israel became an apartheid regime. Human Rights Watch, I should clarify that Selim is a relatively short position paper. It runs probably to about 10 or 11 pages, maybe a little more. Human Rights Watch, it's a very substantial 214 pages. Now, Human Rights Watch traces back the current situation to the birth of the state, to day one of Israel's creation. In fact, it even goes back to the period of the partition resolution in 1947, and then the civil war that ensued after the UN General Assembly passed the partition resolution. The long and the short of it is this. Human Rights Watch basically says that the creation of a Jewish state, not as an abstraction, not the idea of a Jewish state, it's concrete application, the idea is concrete application. It required two things. The, the concrete manifestation of the Jewish state, it required two things. The Zionist movement, then the state of Israel, wanted to create a overwhelming, what was called a strong Jewish majority. And the only way it was able to create this strong Jewish majority was by a mass de facto expulsion of the indigenous population. And the second step was the mass confiscation of Palestinian land of the refugees who were de facto expelled and also the confiscation of the land that the Palestinians who remained in Israel still possessed. It was incrementally but relentlessly confiscated by Israel. The long and the short of it is that the two pillars of Israeli state policy over the past 73 years, the two pillars of the Israeli state policy have been number one, maintaining that strong Jewish majority, and number two, confiscating the land to be used only for Jews. And if you read the Human Rights Watch report carefully, it seems to me you cannot avoid the conclusion that Human Rights Watch has effectively declared illegitimate, illegitimate under international law, the pursuit of, or as it puts it, the engineering of a Jewish majority, which inevitably discriminated against the Palestinian population. And so it's calling into question the legitimacy of the Israeli state, if I understand you correctly. I, I would say, I would just put a slight nuance, not to get too technical about it, but we should be careful so we don't get accused of misconstruing what Human Rights Watch is saying. I would say it's putting into question the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state. Because every aspect, I, I, I really feel I'm not exaggerating, but it might appear to your listeners, every aspect of Israel as it defines itself as a Jewish state is being called into question. So 
it calls into question the legitimacy of trying to engineer and then maintain a Jewish majority. It calls into question the fact that Israel has expropriated 93% of the land in the state of Israel to be used only for Jews. It calls into question confining the majority of Palestinian Israelis in roughly 3% of the land of Israel, the Palestinian municipalities, although Palestinians constitute 19% of the population. Now listen carefully to what I say, because I think even you, I'm not sure how much of the report you've read, so you'll forgive me. It calls into question the legitimacy of the law of return. It calls the, Israeli, into, the Israeli law of return. Yes, the yes. threat yes. of automatic citizenship to any Jew in the world, because it says it discriminates against the Palestinians who were expelled in 1947 through 49, who now number approximately 5.7 million Palestinian refugees and who are denied the right to return to their homeland, which is an, a, uh, a fundamental right under international law, but grants automatic citizenship as they say it, to Jews who had never stepped foot in the land of Israel. It calls into question the legitimacy of the law of return. It then calls into question Israel's right to have two nationalities, a Jewish nationality and an Arab nationality, but the state defines itself as only a state for the self-determination of the Jewish people. And they call that bifurcation between two nationalities, Jews and Palestinians. However, the state is designed only for Jewish self-determination. They call into question the legitimacy of that distinction, because it's, uh, they say it automatically, a state which is only designed for the self-determination of Jewish people, inexorably discriminates against the Palestinians who are not part of the Jews representing, um, not part of the self-determination of the Jewish people. Moeen, are we still on? Um, I believe we are, yes. Okay. So yeah. um, the long and the short of it, Moeen, is without going into every detail, if you were to honor all of international law as Human Rights Watch lays it out, it effectively, now let's be clear, so there's no misconstrual here. Let's start with the most basic proposition. In the state of Israel today, there are eight and a half million citizens. Of those eight and a half million, approximately seven million are Jewish, 1.6 million are Palestinians. Let's call it one Palestinian Arabs. Let's call it 1.5 million. So you have 7 million Jews, 1.5 million Palestinian Arabs. Arabs make up roughly 20% of the state. I don't want to go into all the numbers now. You just have to take my word for it uh, because there are all sorts of qualifications and caveats, which I don't want to go into now. So let's just take the basic. Human Rights Watch calls for the right of all 5.7 million Palestinians to be repatriated. It repeats that several times in the report. If you repatriate the 5.7 million Palestinians uh, in the state of Israel, we're leaving aside the occupied territories now, just the state of Israel. If we repatriate the 5.7 million Palestinians, well, you do the math. 
there goes the Jewish majority. It's going to be 60% Palestinian Arab, 40% uh, Israeli Jewish. Now, I'm not going to say this is going to come to pass. I'm not even going to say it's a realistic proposition. What I'm saying is Human Rights Watch, the leading human rights organization in the world, the most prominent, the most influential, uh, and the most centrist, the most centrist, the leading human rights organization in the world has effectively delegitimized the idea of a Jewish state, not as an abstraction, but the idea of a Jewish state as it has evolved, manifest itself, and concretized itself over the past 73 years. In fact, if you look at the Human Rights Watch at the end, because you're familiar with human rights reports, they have recommendations. Mm -hmm. And the recommendations begin with, to the state of Israel. And these recommendations go on for quite a, quite a significant time, for quite a significant space. And maybe this is a good opportunity, Norm, um, to, to look at the implications of, of the report. I, I would just want to quickly point out Please. that if you, if you read the recommendations, the recommendations, the sum total is to dismantle the whole Jewish state. I'm not joking about that. If you read what they actually call for, dismantle all forms of systematic oppression and discrimination that privilege Jewish Israelis at the expense of Palestinians and otherwise systematically violate Palestinian rights in order to ensure the dominance of Jewish Israelis and end the persecution of Palestinians, including by ending discriminatory policies and practices, and on and on and on. Well, if you eliminate all of that, what they're asking that Israel eliminate, and then at the very end of their recommendations, they say, recognize and honor the right of Palestinians who fled or were expelled from their homes in 1948 and their descendants to enter Israel and reside in the areas where they or their families once lived. There's nothing left. I mean, the bottom line is there's no Jewish state left. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not passing judgment. I'm simply saying, if you read that's what, what the report says. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's, it's, it's a kind of breathtaking phenomenon and I will return to your original point and then get, go back to the significance. The, uh, you brought up the 1975 UN resolution saying Zionism is racism. And that resolution, as you will recall for sure, was widely denounced in the US and most of Western Europe uh, because of its claims about the character of Zionism. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, who became a quite prominent figure in U.S. politics, he made his entire name by denouncing the Zionism as racism resolution in the U.N. General Assembly. And ripping Assembly. it up in the U.N. Yeah. Right, famously holding his hand up with a note. Well, guess what happened? It's a very strange thing the Human Rights Watch report effectively confirmed Zionism is racism. It did. If you speak about Zionism, you might recall that in the book, The Arabs in Israel, it was written by Sabri Jiris. Is that how you pronounce yes, his name? Jiris, right. yes. And when the book came out in the United States, it was published by Monthly Review Press, and Noam Chomsky wrote a preface. And he said, well, of course, there's a lot of hypocrisy when Saudi Arabia denounces Zionism as being racist and discriminatory. But he also says, leaving aside the theory of Zionism, I vividly recall this, he said, as a practical matter, 
the resolution was accurate as a description of how Israel carries on. And that was a shocking thing to say. Noam Chomsky saying the Zionism and is racism resolution is accurate as a practical matter, not as a theory. And now here comes Human Rights Watch 45 years later, and it too de facto says the resolution was accurate from the founding so of now, the state. So if we now fast forward, yeah, if, if we now fast forward yeah. to 2021 and given what you've said about the mm -hmm. ICC and, and, and the cases there, um, but also perhaps um, in, uh, in the broader political dimensions, which, which we'll turn to next, but what do you see as, as the main practical implications? Perhaps not so much this document itself, um, but the increasingly common um, uh, point of view that it's putting forward. There are many things to say in that point, and I know my mind is going to slip here, but let me try to go as quickly as possible, and then different things will come back to me. Number one, both reports, the Betzelm report and the Human Rights Watch report, both reports are recasting the nature of the conflict. Because, mm -hmm. as you well know, for the longest time, since the early 1970s, so we can say roughly 50 years, for the past half century, the attitude of the international community, representative legal bodies, human rights organizations, uh, at the, the uh, paradigm was Israel here, occupied Palestinian territories there. Israel, whatever its shortcomings, whatever its uh, underside, Israel has a right to exist and we have to resolve the question of the occupied Palestinian territories. That's how it was seen. Israel was, for better or for worse, Israel was a done deal. The occupied Palestinian territories, that has to be resolved, and eventually the resolution proposed was two states. Now, both B'Tselem, by calling the whole area an apartheid state, and Human Rights Watch by saying the whole region, not just the state, not just the occupied territories, the whole region is based on the principle of Jewish domination. They have now called into question what hitherto, what had been hitherto a done deal. Israel was a done deal. There was, as you know, there was talk about uh, a just resolution of the refugee question, but that was always thought to be, it would be resolved in mostly a symbolic form. And nothing was said about the internal makeup of Israel. Nothing was said about the internal makeup. The only aspect of Israel that was, I wouldn't call it called into question, but there was talk about there had to be a just resolution of the refugee question. Mm -hmm. Now that Selim says it's an apartheid regime from the river to the sea, Human Rights Watch says it's a regime based on Jewish domination from the river to the sea. It's recast the whole question. It's not just solving the problem, the question of the occupied Palestinian territories, the whole, I hate to use the catchphrases because I loathe the organizations which shout those catchphrases, but I do think it's correct to say the entire legitimacy of the Jewish state enterprise has been called into question now. And that's something new. Secondly, I would point out the significance of it as a reflection of what happened or is happening 
to American Jewry. Because Human Rights Watch is not a radical organization. Human Rights Watch is well within the mainstream of American life. Its leadership includes many liberal Jews. And Jews tend to be at the moderate to liberal progressive end of the political spectrum, which is to say they tend to identify with the ideas and the worldview of an organization like Human Rights Watch. That's the milieu, the ambiance of Jews generally and Jewish intellectuals in particular. If you were to take a typical Human Rights Watch official, someone like Ken Roth, Kenneth Roth, you would guess he reads the New Yorker, he reads the New York Review of Books, he reads the New York Times, he listens to NPR. That's liberal Jews, that's progressive Jews, and it's also moderate Jews too, not as many, but moderate Jews too. I do not believe that Human Rights Watch would have gone out on the limb publishing a report like this unless it felt confident that it could carry its donor base and it could carry its constituency with it. That is to say, I don't believe Human Rights Watch would go out on the limb and then take a saw and cut the limb. Right. It's not the way that Norm, organization... I, yeah. I, I would so, now like also, uh, if, if we could... Um, perhaps move on because I also, um, you know, given recent developments, I do want to have a chance to discuss uh, those in our interview as well. But before doing so, I was curious if you see any significance in the timing of this report, whether you think, for example, that it was designed to try to influence the proceedings in The Hague at the ICC, and whether you think if that was a case, whether it will have an impact. Well, my initial reaction was, uh, as you recall, Moeen, just about six months ago, everything looked absolutely hopeless. Everybody was just despairing and despondent. There was a certain amount of euphoria ecstasy after the um, ICC said it was going to proceed with an investigation. But having studied that very closely, I at any rate, was skeptical about whether all the hurdles could be uh, uh, could be overcome. Now, uh, with the that Selim report, I thought that Selim itself, despairing of any possibility of change inside Israel, issued this report in order to encourage the ICC to proceed with its investigation, notwithstanding the technical hurdles. And I also thought that this was the Human Rights Watch, uh, let's call it its objective to further the pursuit of this ICC investigation. However, Moeen, in thinking it through now, I have a slightly different opinion because I think you will agree with me. Human Rights Watch, if it wanted to further or support or abet the ICC investigation, it didn't have to go so far. It didn't have to call into question the legitimacy of the entire state of Israel. Because the ICC so, is looking exclusively at the occupied territories. Exactly. This is kind of, if you look at it from that lens, it was kind of overkill. And so I had to ask myself, why did they go this far? And my answer to that question is, it's in part, it's not the complete answer, but in part, I should, before I give my explanation, I should make an important point. 
the Human Rights Watch, in its report, repeatedly said that the ICC should not just prosecute Israel for war crimes. It should prosecute them for crimes against humanity, in particular, the crime of persecution and the crime of apartheid. So there again, they went well beyond, you might say, the call of duty. They didn't just ask the ICC to pursue the case. They said to the ICC, you should include new items in your uh, indictment, the items being, quote, among the most odious crimes uh, in international law. So why is this? What's going on? And my view is, number one, there are several aspects. And I can't claim that my enumeration is exhaustive and even necessarily correct. It's speculation. Number one, it's uh, strangely enough, and this is how politics has all these unpredictable concatenations. I think it was partly the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, which uh, sensitized the US population, in particular, the liberal progressive wing of the uh, US population to issues of racial supremacy and racial domination. And when you read the Human Rights Watch report and you read this relentless juggernaut, this maw which gobbles up the land and marginalizes the Palestinian, gobbles up the Palestinian land and marginalizes with the intention of evicting the Palestinian population. And you think to yourself, what would happen if we had laws like that in the United States? It would just cause a complete uproar. There are 900 towns in Israel, 900 towns, which under the law have the right to exclude any non-Jews. They have the legal right, 900 towns. They have the legal right to exclude non-Jews from residency. And you ask yourself, imagine if there were a law like that in the United States. It would create an uproar. And you, in our private conversation, you had said to me at some point, there is a lot of internal HRW exacerbate, ex exasperation and some anger at HRW's refusal to take a more principled stand on how Israel carries on, not only in the occupied Palestinian territories, but Israel itself. And I thought about that, and it did occur to me that there are a lot of very sincere, idealistic young people who go work for Human Rights Watch because they want to be involved in human rights work. And they have been sensitized to issues like racial supremacy and racial domination. And that probably caused a lot of friction and tension until it was finally resolved by Human Rights Watch taking a principled stand on the question. And then I think the second aspect of it is the Israeli political spectrum has just, it's shifted radically. When you or I were growing up and you and I first met each other, the dominant framework was labor. As a matter of fact, the labor party was unthinkable. It was literally unthinkable, a Israeli government that wasn't a labor government until 1977, when Menachem Begin was elected, the Likud 
And that was considered like a seismic shift in Israeli politics. But nowadays, there is no labor. There is no labor party in Israel anymore. There's no center in Israel. There's just a right, a far right, and an ultra right. That's the whole spectrum. And for liberal progressive Jews, that can't but be an extremely alienating reality because you have to remember, if you're an American Jew, you're in the moderate, progressive end of the political spectrum. For the years 2016 to 2020, you had only one political obligation. One, you were supposed to hate Trump. That's it, hate Trump. You were like Nancy Pelosi, you're supposed to join the resistance. So if you read the New York Times, uh, let's say the last year, there are only two issues. Norm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, uh, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. because um, uh, we are running a little short of time. And I, there's two questions I, I very much want to raise with you. And the first is, you know, given your very positive assessment of this report, in brief, were there any issues where you did find their analysis problematic? Um, I will link my... Uh, my remarks on the problematic aspect of the report to what's currently happening in Gaza. Please do. Yeah. yeah, what's currently happening in Gaza. Now, I want to be clear, Moeen. Uh, I don't, I, you know, politics, you have to learn to control your personal opinions and your personal feelings. And you have to try to be as objective, and as they say, I don't know if it has any meaning, but try to be as scientific as you can be. Uh, I, I think the Human Rights Report was a tremendous achievement as a piece of investigation, scholarship, its comprehensiveness, its authoritativeness. Uh, and my quibbles with the Human Rights Watch, I would say, are definitely trivial next to the thrust of the report. And I want to honor all of those, in particular, uh, Omar, um, you know, his name Shaker. just slipped my mind. Shocker, Omar Shocker. Yeah. Shocker, who is the print, who is acknowledged as the principal author of the report. Uh, where I differ, and it does connect to what's happening right now, in particular with Gaza. Human Rights Watch, it continues to recognize this entity, which it calls the Occupy Palestinian Territories. And it still recognizes Israel as the occupier. And as an occupier, it recognizes Israel's right to security or right to under the geneva conventions though human rights watch doesn't use this expression i'm using it the right to maintain public order or certain right to security is that correct now i'm going to go through the law i don't want to get into a conflict with human rights watch at this point i want to just go through the law as i understand it and I'll explain why it's important. Number one, or I should say Human Rights Watch uses the expression, Israel has legitimate security, security interests. Concerns. They use concerns, I think. It may be interests. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Let's just call it legitimate yeah. security concerns. Now, here's where I differ, and here's why it's relevant. Under international law, what makes an occupation is it's temporary. That's the essence of an occupation. If it's not temporary, then it's no longer an occupation. It's an annexation. Under international law, Article 2 of the UN Charter, it's an illegal uh, annexation because under international law, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by force or in the UN 
Resolution 242, inadmissible to acquire territory by war. Okay, so the occupied territories are no longer occupied territories, they are annexed territories. This is not my opinion. It's Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch's opinion if you read the letter of their report, because they keep reiterating, not me, them, they keep reiterating that Israeli governments have repeatedly said they are not going to withdraw. Well, if a government affirms it's not going to withdraw, then it's an annexation. Under international law, that is illegal. So Israel no longer has any legitimate security rights in Gaza or the West Bank because it's no longer a legal occupant of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. So what does that mean concretely? As you know, because we dis we discussed it, uh, our, we, we discussed it uh, in conversation beforehand, at the end of the summary of the report, not the full body of the report, at the end of the summary, they have, it's a very moving, you know, it's a touching summary at the end, the last paragraph. And they say, every day a child in Gaza is born into a prison. And then you have to ask yourself the question. Human Rights Watch itself, describes Gaza as a prison. Human Rights Watch itself says that 96% of the water in Gaza is unfit for human consumption. Human Rights Watch itself says 50% of the people are unemployed in Gaza and among the young people, it's a much higher percentage. Human Rights Watch says that the people there are trapped in a prison. Now, does Israel have any legitimate security interests in Gaza? Under international law, it has only one legitimate right, and that is the right to leave. It has the right to leave. It does not have the right to stay in Gaza or control Gaza externally. It doesn't have that right. And the people of Gaza have every right, in my opinion, every right to use every means to free themselves from that prison. There is no right, no right of Israel to imprison one million children in Gaza. Now that is the fact, half, and I hope every one of your listeners will remember this statistic. Half of Gaza's population are children. They are children under the age of 18 years old. Does Israel have any legitimate security interest in confining one million children in a prison. In my opinion, and I think the law supports me, they have no right, and Palestinians in Gaza have every right to use every means at their disposal to free themselves from that prison and to free those children
who have been confined, their children who have been confined in that prison. Does Hamas have the right to shoot fire what are called rockets? I'm a skeptic and I remain a skeptic on that point. If we had time, I would go through it. Does Hamas have the right to fire rockets? International law says that states or peoples, and there is a state of Palestine, so let's leave aside peoples. States have the right, you may not like the law, you may not like the law, but it's still the law. The law is you have the right to engage in what are called belligerent reprisals. That is to say, when your adversary is breaking the law, you have the right to break the law until they stop. Now, that is, I would call it a controversial area in international law. However, it is not controversial that both the US and the UK and Israel claim the right to belligerent reprisals. Now, Human Rights Watch says that it, Israel is committing crimes against humanity in Gaza, that Israel has been systematically committing and methodically committed, committing crimes against humanity in Gaza. That's a higher level of crime than a war crime. Israel has been consistently committing crimes against humanity in Gaza. The people of Gaza have the right to belligerent reprisals against the Israeli civilian population until as Israel stops breaking the law. That's how I understand it. That's how I understand the law. And I think my understanding is correct. I will admit it's a kind of gray area. I will acknowledge that. My credo in life is you never quarrel with facts. And I will acknowledge a gray area there. But I cannot believe that any sane, moral, civilized person could possibly believe that Israel has any legitimate right to confine one million children in a prison where 96% of the water is, quote, and here I'm quoting Human Rights Watch, which is, I think, quoting the World Health Organization, 96% of the water is unfit for human consumption. No, I Norm. cannot go there. I can't go there. That's Norm. unacceptable. Norman, um, I, th I think we've come to the end of our time. Uh, I think it's been a very rich discussion both of um, the, the substance and the implications of the Human Rights Watch report, and also would like to thank you for making it relevant to the developments that, that we've been seeing uh, today. So Professor Norman Finkelstein, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to be on uh, Connections, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Oh, thank you so much, Moeen. And, um... We've been comrades for 50 years and or 40 years now. Uh, I hope it will be forever. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you, Norm. Bye-bye.